Hey there, good morning everybody. It is what, the 7th of April, 2021, 10 o'clock in the morning, and this is probably the most unusual location I've ever done the broadcast in. Actually, it's not all that unusual. I'm at the church today, and uh, we've been working all week long, decorating for our spring program, trying to get everything ready to go for this weekend. And so we showed up nice and early today, and uh, I'm taking a break from the manual labor to do some spiritual labor here. And we started yesterday the book of Romans. Romans chapter number one is where we began. And so obviously today, chapter number two, the book of Romans is written by the apostle Paul. He's writing it to Roman people, the church at Rome, which we said yesterday is not to be confused with the Roman Catholic Church. And yes, today, Rome is the headquarters for the Roman Catholic Church, but that wasn't the case in the time of Paul writing to the church at Rome. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church didn't, didn't even exist at that time. And so something I brought up yesterday that I wanna make sure we reiterate for at least a few days here is Romans can be a deep and very complicated theological study and we're not doing that in these morning devotions. These morning devotions are to be read and helped, practical applications, and just to get a general idea of what the author is trying to do here uh, in getting the Word of God to us. And so keep that in mind. If you're wondering, well, why didn't he mention this? Or why didn't we go deeper into that? Because we would spend a year on this book if we approached it in that way. And so we try to cover just one chapter a day, and uh, that's what we're going to continue to do. So without further ado, let me go ahead and pray with you this morning, and then we will cover Romans chapter number two. This is weird, by the way. I'm using an iPad to do the devotion. Usually I use my laptop. I don't know why I didn't think to bring that. So hopefully this all goes across normally. And uh, I don't know, we'll see what happens, right? So let's pray together. Father, we love you. We ask your blessing on our study here this morning. Thank you for this book and all the things it teaches us and gives us. What a wonderful blueprint for salvation the book of Romans is. Give us wisdom today. Give me wisdom. Give me your mind as we read through this book and try to interpret it properly. I pray that you would help us today. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. All right, 29 verses here in Romans chapter number two. So let's get started. Romans one showed us this progression of the depravity of man. It showed us how wicked man can become when left to his own devices, rejecting God, doing his own thing. That's Romans chapter number one. And now we get to chapter number two. And the first half of this chapter is going to talk about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you present yourself to be something that you're not. So let's pick it up here in verse number one. Therefore, because of chapter one, the slide, the rejection of God, the failure to be grateful, those types of things, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. So we're coming from the, the direction of, of a hypocrite here. Someone who claims to be something that they're not, or they allow certain things in their life that they condemn in other people's lives and so forth. So thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. So those who spend their time and their lives judging other people and criticizing other people for behavior or choices, they really don't have an excuse for their judgmental spirit because thou condemnest thyself for thou that judgest doeth the same things. Here's what it comes down to. We're all sinners. Some of us sin in different ways than others of us sin, but in the end, we're all sinners and we're all guilty before God. And so what we try to do is we try to find an area in which we're strong and we condemn a person who's weak in that same area. Well, you ought to be more like me. I've got that area squared away. Well, maybe you ought to be more like them because the area in which you're weak, they're strong in. 
And so for us to judge and nitpick one another and criticize each other and tear each other down is not helpful to the cause of Christ. It's not helpful to the work of God. We're supposed to be working together, striving together to accomplish the will of God. And so when a person judges another or criticizes another, they themselves are guilty of the same things. In fact, sometimes we're hardest on other people in areas where we know we have a shortcoming. Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And so the yardstick by which we measure our own spirituality sometimes is the spirituality of another person. And that's not how you judge. You don't judge your spirituality based on how someone else is doing. Judge your spirituality on the basis of the Word of God. Now, we all, that way the yardstick doesn't move. There's no, uh, there, there, there's no one uh, recommendation for one person and another for another person. No, you can't move the goalpost this way. The Word of God is true. And it stands fast and it never changes. And it's been the same since the foundation of the world when God gave it to us. And so judge yourself according to it, not according to someone else. Because what we tend to do is we find someone who's not as spiritual as we are maybe. And we'll say, uh, hey, I'm better than that guy. And then we'll find somebody who's more spiritual than us. And we'll say, well, you know, there's a reason I'm not as spiritual as they are. Uh, and we'll try to pull them down. That's it, what Paul's saying here is use the word of God as the measuring stick because that's how God's going to judge you. You know, you're not going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord say, you know, you were a lot better a Christian than your husband was or than your wife was or than your neighbor was or than your pastor was. He's going to say, let's see how you measured up according to the word of God. Now we don't have anyone else to use as our scapegoat. Verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Now keep in mind, as we start heading through these verses, if you're not careful, you'll be looking at this through the perspective of salvation. And it's not talking about salvation here. It's talking about pleasing God. And so if you look at it through a salvation lens, you're going to think that work salvation is being taught, and it's just not. Verse number four, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? One of the things that people say mistakenly often is, yeah, you know, there just came a day when I was uh, decided I was going to seek after God. And the truth is, no men seek after God. God seeks us out. He's seeking every man. He's appealing to every man. He's getting the gospel to the life of every man. He is uh, using his spirit to draw every man. And so when we say, yeah, we sought God and we found him. No, he sought us and he found us. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. That's for salvation. It's also his goodness that leads us to sanctification. When we decide, you know what? God is so good to me, I'm going to start doing right by him. A lot of folks make the claim that those who believe in eternal security, that salvation can never be lost, they say, oh, well, if I believe that, I'd sin all I wanted to. I'd just get saved to avoid hell, and then I'd live like the devil. Well, that's not what happens. God's goodness in saving us and blessing us leads us to clean up our lives even more. It's the opposite effect of what these people think and say. Verse number six, note five. But after they, thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So again, not talking about salvation here, but judgment, whether it be the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, depending on where someone ends up. So after the hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath. So the more we resist God, the more we push back against him when he's trying to you know, grow us and mature us spiritually, the more we resist that, 
then the more that invites the wrath of God into our lives uh, and the wrath of God on the day of judgment. Verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So whether it's the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, it's our deeds that are going to be judged. Now, let me explain. The great white throne judgment is a judgment reserved for those who rejected Christ, those who are going to die and go to hell. That's that judgment. And what are they going to be judged on the basis of? They'll be judged on the basis of their works. First off, their sin, and then the degree of their sin versus the degree of their righteousness. You know, someone who is inherently evil, who steps on other people, takes advantage of others for their own benefit, hell is going to be worse off for them than someone who just never said yes to the gospel, but tried to live a good life and tried to be generous and helpful to others. They'll both go to hell, but they're going to go to hell in different degrees of punishment on the basis of their works. Likewise, those who've received Christ as Savior, they're going to go to a judgment seat called the judgment seat of Christ. And there will not be judged for their sin because their sin is forgiven. It's been covered by the blood of Christ and God will remember it no more. We're not judged for our sin at the judgment seat of Christ. We will be judged according to our works, however. Did we serve God? Did we bear fruit as a Christian? That's what he's going to judge us over. And so he will render either punishment for those who will go to hell or reward for those who will go to heaven according to his deeds. So what Paul's doing is completely deconstructing people who are self-righteous based on their comparison of, of their Christian life with other people. You can't get away with that. That's not how you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged according to this book. And so that's where you're going to live or die. Verse number seven, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. And that's where you can get confused if you're not careful about salvation here. Uh, we're going to persevere. We're going to live for God. We're going to uh, do good works so that we can receive the proper reward. Verse 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'm sorry, of the Gentile. And so the resistance of the law of God, the resistance of the leading of God, those are things that are our rebellion is not going to prove well and fruitful for us. And it says to the Jew and the Gentile, because with God, there is no race, there is no ethnicity, there is no gender. There, it's we're all human beings given a will of God to seek and to follow, obey and live. And we're not going to be able to use any excuses in that day. Verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God, which is pretty much what we just covered. By the way, that works in a positive way as well. Sometimes you see God's blessings on someone's life and you go, God, would you do that for me? And the answer to that is, yeah, I'll do that for you too. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you rebel against me, you're going to find life very hard. Verse 12, for as many have sinned, as many as have sinned without law, shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And not talking about justified in terms of salvation, I'm talking about justified in terms of living up to God's expectations of our potential for him. Verse number 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. And so we're getting into the area of conscience here. Before I was even saved, I still had a conscience that would condemn me at times uh, or that would uh, give me feelings of, of accomplishment and well-doing, that type of thing. So the conscience of man, even if he doesn't know the law of God, he doesn't isn't versed in it, has never read it or been taught it, 
God puts in each man that conscience that is a law unto ourselves. We know when we're not doing right. We know when we're not pleasing God, or we're, we just know when we're not doing right by our fellow man. And so what he's saying is, you Jews, you've had the law, and that law is what's told you where you're falling short. Well, the Gentiles who don't have the law, they still have their own law that's given to them by their conscience. And so that conscience steering them becomes a law in itself. Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So just the fact that we have this heart and this conscience that guides us, it tells us that the law is present with us even before we ever hear of it. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. And so that law either says, hey, proceed, or hey, you shouldn't do that. Verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so we'll face God and our heart will be bared before God and ourselves and uh, we'll give an answer for it. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. And so now the dialogue is changing just a little bit here from this point on. And it's going to talk about the Jew himself and his relationship with God, given the fact that he's been given the law of God. So verse 17, behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that thyself that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest the boast of the law through the breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God? And so he's saying, okay, now you Jews that are a bit self-righteous here, you think because you have the law and the Gentiles didn't have it, didn't, uh, be, weren't able to rely on it, let's talk to you guys because you claim to be a teacher of these things. You claim to have some knowledge that the others don't have. Well, what good is it doing you? You know, do you claim to know that you shouldn't steal, but you steal anyway? And he gives us all these examples. Do you know you shouldn't commit adultery, but you commit adultery anyway? You shouldn't worship idols, and yet you worship idols anyway? You know, it just, it's, not, it's one thing to know it, but it's another thing to obey it and follow through. So just because you know it doesn't make you any better than anybody else. There's a lot of folks in, in, in churches these days that, man, they know their Bible. They don't live any of it. Doesn't make the, there's no, there's, there's no fruit from that. That, that doesn't, that's not benefiting them at all. It's one thing to know it, but it's a whole nother thing to do it. Remember what God told, uh, told uh, Saul when he offered the sacrifice instead of obeying by destroying all the animals and the people there uh, when he when he attacked he said to obey is better than to sacrifice you know we can approach God and say God I know what it is you want but if we don't obey what he wants then there's no victory there verse number 23 thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou God you know, you know the law and you say, yeah, I know it because I'm violating it right now. You're dishonoring God when you do that. Verse 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, uh, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So here's what he's saying. You go to church on Sunday, your coworkers know it, but then you go to work and you tell the dirty jokes and you use a filthy mouth and you're stealing from the company and all those lost coworkers are saying, how's he any different than us? How's she any different than us? 
She's doing the same thing. She says the same thing. She tells the same jokes. She's no better than we are. And so you, by disobeying God, actually bring yourself down to the level of the lost. Let's read it again so we can put it together here. Uh, verse number 25, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. If you don't obey the law, then it's as though you're not even saved. You're not even one of God's people. And of course, he's talking to Jews here, so he's using circumcision as an example. When you became circumcised as a male Jew, you're being set apart as a child of God. And so when, when those who were uncircumcised, they weren't part of that. But even strangers who were uh, going with the children of Israel would submit to circumcision because it was an outward symbol of their inward decision. Verse number 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? He says, so, okay, so let's take a Gentile now who abides by the law. Even though he's uncircumcised, he's acting as a child of God. So what he's getting down to here is your outward manifestation of your Christianity really doesn't amount to much. It's who you are in your heart and what you're actually doing. You know, I know a lot of Christians that, you know, they've got uh, the, the proper uh, hairstyle, they got the proper appearance, they got the proper dress, they got the proper words, uh, the whole nine yards, but man, in their heart, they are just not godly people. They look the part but they're not. Then I've known some people who, who truly love God and they, they, they rejoice in the Lord and they're close to him. And they walk with him. And to be quite honest with you, they're, they're not all that put together. Uh, I think their appearance isn't quite what God would want it to be. Uh, they make some decisions that I don't think that God is entirely pleased with, but boy, they're far better run than the first guy is. Now, truth be told, let's hit on both those cylinders. Let's be inwardly and outwardly what God would like to see from us and what would best exemplify a testimony to this world. Verse number 27. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision thus transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So let's say that today I decided, you know what, I'm going to become a Jew. And I go to New York City and I move to that section of town where all the Hasidic Jews live. And I go to the clothing store and I buy a shirt made of the one fiber and it's got the tassels off the corners of it. And I buy a hat and I stop trimming the corners of my beard and all these different things. And I do all those outward things uh, that exemplify Judaism. Am I a Jew? I'm not. I'm a Gentile. I'm not, I wasn't born. I don't have that Jewish blood and so forth. And so I can put on all the outward adornments of being a Jew. It still doesn't make me a Jew. And he's saying here, you can actually have the heart of a Jew in terms of loving God and following God and serving him without any of that stuff. Because God sees not as man sees, as we learned uh, in the story of David. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Now, that's not to say outward appearance doesn't matter. The Bible's clear about that, too. We ought to take care of the outward appearance as God leads us, instructs us to. But that's not where we stop. In fact, I dare say, the more you take care of the heart, the outward appearance tends to take care of itself. But the easy stuff to change is the outward. The hard stuff to change is the heart. You know, it's easy to dress more modestly and, and to look uh, godly and not carnally and worldly. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to make those changes. You know what's harder to do? Overcome envy, to stop being covetous, to uh, love the word of God with a passion. Those things are harder to come by than just going and getting a haircut right? Uh, not getting any more tattoos and that kind of thing. It's, it's clear. The heart are where the giants live, and we've got to conquer those giants. All right.
That's chapter number two. We'll move on from there tomorrow morning. Uh, I don't know where we'll be. Maybe we'll be here again, doing more work in the morning. Maybe we'll be at the house. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but this was different and different is fun. And I hope that you enjoy the broadcast this morning. As always, please like, love, share the post, get the word out there, and uh, hopefully we'll have more tune in to watch and learn with us. All right. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day.